So I am, uh, so just so everybody knows, I'm Chris Brooks with Labor Notes. Uh, in case you aren't familiar with Labor Notes, we are uh, an organization that just turned 40 this year, which we're very happy about. Um, we're a media and organizing project. So we have a monthly news magazine that we publish. We have a website and has stories about what's going on in the labor movement with a focus on rank and file folks and how they organize and how they're taking on the boss and transforming their unions. Um, we also organize workshops all across the country and do lots of trainings. We have conferences. We have troublemaker schools, which are like big one-day trainings. We have um, our big Labor Notes conference in Chicago every two years, uh, which uh, Rebecca and Emily were both at, which was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, hi, Jackie. Um, and just so folks know, uh, we are um, recording this tonight, so we'll be able to share it with everybody. Um, afterwards. So if you want that link, you can feel free to contact me, just chris at labornotes.org. Um, and we do offer monthly webinars. This is a little bit special. We, we organize this just for the teachers in Tennessee to be able to learn from the experiences of rank and file activists like Emily in West Virginia and Rebecca in Arizona. Um, so, you know, uh, there are other webinars that, that are put out monthly and you can just find those, that information on our website or by signing up for our e-blast. Um, so, all I have to say is that like Labor Notes is here to try to be a resource to connect rank and file activists all around the country to one another and to share out organizing um, tools and skills and resources. Um, so uh, that's kind of the spirit that, that we're doing this tonight. Um, so we have two folks joining us, Emily Comer from West Virginia and Rebecca Gorelli from Arizona. And, and um, the goal is to talk about how they organized as, as activists on the ground in their schools for the statewide strikes that they engaged in, uh, which is a very huge and exciting feat. Um, so as folks are joining on, if you could just mute your phone, so that way we can make sure that we can hear them. Um, so to start out, we're gonna hear from Emily about what happened in West Virginia um, and how they organized the strike there. And then she'll talk for a bit, and then we'll allow Rebecca to talk about what happened in Arizona. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up to questions from, from everybody else. Um, all right, so Emily, feel free to take it away. Hi. Uh, I'm Emily. I'm a high school Spanish teacher in South Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, and I'm really excited to be on this call with all of you tonight. And I just want to thank Labor Notes. Thank you for organizing this. Um, so I'm sure that everybody on this call knows that around this time last year, uh, we, hold on, I'm trying to figure out, I can't, I minimize you and I can't see you now. Okay, there you are. Um, yeah, around this time last year, uh, we teachers and school service personnel, so bus drivers, cooks, custodians, uh, and West Virginia went on strike for nine days over rising healthcare costs. Uh, we ended up winning a 5% raise, uh, plus we killed bad legislation that would have brought in charter schools, attacked seniority, uh, and basically uh, busted unions uh, by attacking our, like messing with our automatic dues. Uh, they call that paycheck protection. Um, and then we went on strike also this year against charter schools and we won. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the background for uh, last year's strike and how we got there. Um, politically speaking, from what I hear, West Virginia is pretty similar to Tennessee. Um, so we used to be a solid blue state until pretty recently. Um, Democrats were in control for 88 years until I believe 2015 uh, when the GOP swept our elections. Um, and since then we've seen right to work legislation passed. Um, it actually got struck down yesterday in the circuit court. Um, and so any, we've seen state, leg, uh, state legislators like aggressively go after unions uh, in those few years. Uh, but even earlier, in 2007, we saw Joe Manchin, our governor at the time, pass a massive $200 million uh, corporate tax cuts uh, and business tax cuts that have really put a huge strain on working class people here. Um, so in 2017, when we got the news that we were going to see these uh, huge benefits cuts in our health insurance, uh, that's really what we were up against. Our unions had not been a site of power in a very long time. Uh, the last teacher strike had been in 1990, 
the year I was born, and that strike won a $5,000 across the board raise. Uh, but basically since then, uh, you know, for a long time, the feeling had been that our unions were good at handling grievances and not so much else. Um, I'm an AFT member and, you know, the biggest event of the year was like a lobby day. Um, and I don't know, it became clear to me and really a lot of people uh, that just going to our representatives and sort of asking nicely was not getting us very far and that something had to change. Um, so in the summer of 2017, I met Jay O'Neill uh, while doing Medicare for All work, uh, Medicare for All organizing in DSA. Uh, Jay is a teacher, he's in WVEA, and I'm in uh, AFT. And we basically shared the same perspective, um, that something needed to change. Um, it can be the same old way of doing things. And so we started a reading group with NDSA for teachers. Uh, we read No Shortcuts by Jane McAlevey. Uh, we ended up sort of deciding that, uh, like in our opinion, the only way to win funding for PEIA, our health insurance, uh, was to build an escalated campaign with real demands. Uh, and we agreed that that might take a strike and it you know, might take a credible strike threat. So Jay ended up creating a Facebook group called West Virginia Public Employees United. Uh, and I came on as an admin shortly after. Um, the purpose of this group was to bring people together across unions because in West Virginia we have AFT, we have WVEA, and we have WVSSPA, which is a smaller uh, school service personnel union. Um, and it can be really difficult to get all three of them to work together. Um, you know, if one union is doing one thing, you know, it's, uh, some people don't even belong to a union. So uh, having this group allowed us to sort of all be in the know and all be on the same page as we were building this campaign. Um, we also called it West Virginia Public Employees United and also allowed all public employees in it, not just school employees. Uh, because this campaign was about uh, PEIA, our health insurance, which covers one in nine West Virginians. Um, and we're looking at building a, you know, as broad a movement as possible. Um, this down the road ended up doing wonders, I think, for our public support uh, when it was time to go on strike. So after we created the Facebook group, we started showing up like anywhere we could with sign-in sheets to recruit people into the group. Uh, we went to town hall meetings, we went to PEIA public hearings, literally anywhere that had public employees there uh, or teachers, we were there getting people signed up and then we would send them an email with a link to the Facebook group um, and get them in the group. Uh, we also started escalating by bird dogging or confronting legislators about PEIA saying, uh, how are you going to fund PEIA or will you commit to uh, funding it with this progressive tax, etc. and getting that on camera and then uh, posting it into the Facebook group. Um, and a lot of those videos um, really did numbers. Um, so I remember going to uh, this one subcommittee, it was like a PEIA subcommittee meeting at the Capitol that no one ever goes to and we had created an event uh, to get a bunch of people to go. We packed the room. We ended up getting both of our state union leaders there too. And our legislators were shocked that anyone even showed up. And uh, I was filming and they made me, the chair made me take down my live stream. I ended up confronting the chair on camera afterwards. And that video went sort of like West Virginia viral. <laughs> and that ended up uh, getting so much attention from teachers on Facebook. Uh, who had, many of them had never been to a union meeting before, they had never been involved, uh, but suddenly they're just like seeing this activity on their, you know, on their Facebook feed uh, and engaging and paying attention in this way and asking questions and uh, becoming part of this movement. Um, so from that point there was this real groundswell and we had, I guess, about a thousand uh, members in our group in late December and that grew to about 24,000 by the time the strike started which was in late February uh, and all this growth happened over the course of other escalating actions that we were organizing like uh, greeting the governor with a banner at the state of the state address uh, 
um, which, you know, only like four people, only like four of us showed up to do that. And we were, I remember disappointed that we couldn't get more people to show up, but um, uh, we did more sort of videos of confronting legislators. We ended up doing walk-ins at our schools, um, taking it more to the building level and not just on social media. Um, so we did walk-ins, we did red t-shirt days, um, which of course spilled over into social media when you saw all these pages of educators wearing red uh, and their whole school wearing red. Um, and of course, in early February, you saw the Southern counties of West Virginia do one day walkouts. Um, it was really strange to think back on all of this and sort of condense it into this timeline because when we started organizing for this, um, we realized how much of an uphill battle it was going to be. And I think there's some small part of me that didn't actually believe it was going to happen, like that we weren't up to the you know, we weren't really going to go on this ever. And, uh, hey, Emily, just real quick, if somebody's phone is keeping, if everybody could just make sure to please mute your phones um, while you're on the call so we can clearly hear Emily. I'd appreciate it. Sorry, please continue. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there was part of me that didn't uh, really ever believe it would happen, um, that our movement would never grow to this. Uh, it's hard to ever really believe that... Um, we could have something like that, you know? I think uh, when you're an organizer, you kind of you reach for the sky, right? And you get used to losing. Um, but also, you know, we're up against a Republican House, a Republican Senate, a Republican governor. And, um, you know, to be frank, um, a union leadership that didn't really want to strike in the first place. Um, and so the strike was really rank and file led. Um, so when things really started to go in late January, we started having these emergency meetings uh, with our unions. Um, I remember one meeting uh, that WVEA had that I went to because they opened it up to everyone. Um, we were demanding, you know, we were asking questions. We wanted to go out. We said, when is the strike? Uh, people were asking that. And our union leadership, or not my union leadership, but the WVEA leadership was saying, um, you know, we can't have a strike. It's not gonna be like 1990. Uh, and they were giving all of these reasons that a strike would be impossible. And really they were, I mean, they were sort of scaring us out of going out on strike. Um, and that was happening around the state and not just in WVEA, um, but it didn't work. Um, people wanted to go out, we were pushing, um, and at that point, everybody was pushing. Um, you know, I think having a GOP legislature didn't matter, uh, the strike being illegal didn't matter. Um, you know, when you have people so, at that point, when we had people so fired up about this uh, campaign, uh, people were ready. And by the time we went out, uh, when you have every school in the state shut down, um, you know, that kind of power is pretty hard to contend with. Yep. I think that's all. Excellent. Um, well, thank you for that overview. There's a lot to unpack there, um, but we'll move to Arizona first. Uh, and Rebecca, you can feel free to please take it away. Right, well, thank you. I also want to say thanks, Labor Notes, for always hooking us up with people across the nation. This is amazing. So, and Emily, thanks to you, obviously, <laughs> because without the work that happened in West Virginia, Arizona wouldn't exist. Um, and I mean that truthfully. Um, and the, the first piece is uh, the solidarity that came with uh, Jay O'Neill, our fearless West Virginia leader, who actually helped me uh, earn the courage to make our first Facebook page. And so um, down here, we started about a year ago on uh, March 2nd last year. So the anniversary is coming up. And so for us, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard, Arizona is the bottom of the barrel for every single education statistic that exists. Literally teacher pay, per pupil funding, uh, student to counselor ratio, class size, and the number of tax cuts that exist here are ridiculous and tax exemptions. So basically, and we have vouchers 
and we have ESAs and STOs and every piece of ALEC legislation that you could ever imagine is here. And so public schools have been starved here and charters have been pushed like crazy. And so I think for us, we didn't have to do all that groundwork that Emily sort of had to do because Emily did it for us, right? And so if I'm in Tennessee's shoes right now, I'm thinking, man, the, the groundwork has already been laid by all these different states. It's just a matter of how are you going to put that package together and deliver it out? Um, because our members, uh, the minute I made the Facebook page, I mean, it just exploded. All, I heard the word strike and the first three comments that were made, you know, and it's like, yes, we're doing this. And so for us, it was like out of the gate insane. So we had to slow it down. And we had to be mindful of, of where people were at because people were very angry and had been for about a decade, right? Their wages kept going down and their insurance kept going up. And so they're taking home less and less pay. And so, you know, people were very angry. They just needed a way to harness that anger and drive it into the path that would get them to be successful. And so we started, um, you know, just simple wearing red shirts. We came up with Red for Ed Wednesdays. Um, and, you know, we started, you know, we, sorry, you guys, I have three little kids under the age of five. If you hear banging, I apologize. That's my kids trying to find me. <laughs> so we started Red for Ed Wednesdays. That was our first action. And just like Emily said, it's all about an escalation campaign. You cannot come out of the gate you know, guns blazing. You have to build community support. You have to build courage and solidarity throughout the state. You have to figure out ways to plug different people in on a variety of actions, anywhere from wearing a red shirt all the way up to going out on strike on a, on a huge job action. And so for us, what kept us in our, in, our, in our planning mind is, you know, if you, you know, everyone's calling for strike and if you want to do this huge job action, well, how about you wear a red shirt first? Let's see how many of those people we can get out there. Let's use social me media to build that visual presence. And so for us, I mean, we already knew what the end game was. We knew we wanted to go out on strike. We knew we were organizing a walkout from day one. It was just a matter of what that timeline is. And so when, when folks ask us, like, how did you build the timeline is we didn't. We knew the legislative session was going to end here, and we, we backwards planned it, you know, just like any good teacher would do, is I unit plan backwards, right? And so we built, our first week was Red for Ed shirts, post on social media, how many people we got, tons of people. Then the next week was, um, you know, post on uh, with a, a sign with three reasons why you're red for ed and so we started to tell the story and stories are an incredibly powerful way to get people to move past fear if you don't tell stories nobody understands that there's other people that are like them and they they can connect so much better if you have a way to tell the story and so that was just everybody seeing all the different problems in the class size and all these different crazy aspects and people are going, oh man, I'm not alone. Okay, let's do this. I'm not afraid. That fear just starts coming off real fast. And so solidarity is a huge part of an escalation campaign. And I am no expert on this. However, I was part of the Chicago Teachers Union strike of 2012. And so we used many of the tactics that was in Chicago um, here in Arizona. And if you're curious of, of how that campaign went, here's a, here's a book you need to get. I always put this on my calls. Uh, it's a labor notes book. And you can see all the post-its because we literally used this uh, playbook. Um, so you build your campaign, right? You got your red shirts. Then the next week you go on to red shirts, tell the story. And then you know, we started to every Wednesday, let's see how many campuses we had and et cetera. And we kept building and then we decided, okay, you know, let's, let's hold a rally. Let's, let's flex our muscles a little bit. We need to know where our power stands. And so let's get together. Let's have a rally. We created a teach in where we told stories and talked about funding and all of those things. And then we threw in a little rah, rah, here's our five demands. And our demands were clear. I mean, we asked for raises. We asked for, um, competitive pay for our uh, classified staff because you know that wall-to-wall -wall organizing and including everybody is really where you build your power right like Emily said 
And so we included all of those things in our five demands. And we announced them at a huge rally. We got about 6,000 people down there. We made chant cards and it was, it was planned to a T, like a beautiful lesson, right? We had every, all the materials ready to go. And so through these weeks, and that was probably like our third or fourth weekend, it was um, March 28th, I believe was our rally. And as we were going, whatever we did, we had a way to measure our power. So we created like URLs or a way to take attendance or give people a QR code to just clock how many people are we reaching. We asked people to ratify the demands. And we ended up having thousands upon thousands of people ratify these demands. And so not only is escalating part of a really successful campaign, but taking, collecting data, measuring. You have to have me metrics. I mean, it's just like your students, right? You need to know where you're going in order to plan your next step. And so we did that. We held rallies. And at the same time, we, and I want to make clear that this wasn't just a union thing. We created a rank and file network, a huge network. And our page was the rank and file, but we also worked with our union. And we had this parallel relationship where we had kind of the voice of the teachers and they had kind of the resources and the funding and other aspects that we didn't have, right? But we had the power and the voice of the teachers. And so another critical uh, component of our campaign and why we were so successful is we built what we call the liaison network. And what this is, is we asked people to volunteer with a Google form. I mean, something so simple. We asked people to sign up. Um, so that way two things could happen. We knew how many schools we were reaching statewide. We knew how many schools existed. And so then we could backwards plan and try to figure out the gaps of where we had people, where we didn't, let's fill in those holes. And then um, once we had this liaison group, um, we started educating them. We would build presentations like Google slide presentations that we would give to the liaison so that they can turn around, go back to their schools and not have to prepare a single thing. Because not only are people not hardcore organizers they maybe they don't know where to start right and so we every time we did something we modeled it we said here's what we want you to do first second third fourth here go 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 here's a slide for each thing we want you to do and then come back report back and tell us you know how it went so there was a feedback loop that we continued to close but one successful thing is whatever we asked people to do whether it was a walk-in or a part you know a, a campaign party or something is we asked them to take attendance, clock attendance, and we gave them the materials. So as we escalated, we started to build this liaison network and we would use Action Network to send out mass emails. We would also use the uh, text messaging system, Remind, and ask every single school site to have their own Remind system so that we would send out information, they could turn around, send it out to their members. And so when all was said and done, we had over 1,200 sites and 1,200 liaisons. Now, some of those liaisons doubled up as union site reps. And so that wasn't the case everywhere, though. So anywhere that we didn't have a union site rep, we filled that gap with a liaison. And I'm talking rural nation. I'm talking Native American reservation land where there isn't a strong union presence. We built our own presence there. And so as we escalated, we moved on to, okay, we got our sites organized, we're feeling good about this, we're getting people to come to 10 minute meetings, we're collecting information and you know, school by school, we knew we were, we were getting up there and then we decided April was gonna be our community solidarity month is what we called it. And we asked people to make events on the weekends and go out and organize. And what that does is it gets people out in the public. And when you see a group of people wearing red shirts, people are gonna start asking questions and they're gonna go, what are you doing? Who are you? What's going on? Oh, hey, come join me. Oh, here's some information for you. And so we had little palm cards. We were out making posters in the city, in the suburbs, and we did car painting parties. Now that sounds kind of lame in a way, but the reason it worked, and what I mean is we use these car markers. They're like markers you can write on windows of a car. I don't know if you guys have seen our Red for Ed car painting. But what it did is it gave some people an action to do a way to get together, a way to get out in public. And that was our, one of our biggest tickets was this car painting idea. Because anywhere you traveled, it was the biggest message of solidarity you can see anywhere. I'm on the highway looking at 10 cars that say Red Fred. I know I'm not alone. That fear just keeps melting away. And I'm, I'm, ready, to, I'm ready to go.
you know, come, it only took us eight weeks to pull this off. People were ready. They're like, yeah, I painted my car, whatever. Yeah, I'm wearing shirts, whatever. What do you got next? You know, just eating it, eating it, eating it. But it's because we built this insane campaign, this organizing blitz and escalate, 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 escalate. And we did it in such a crazy way that people just ate it up and ate it up because they didn't have to think. They had all the tools ready to go. We built a website with everything you can download, walk-in flyers, walk-in posters. We did standouts. Anything you can think of, we did. And then we canvassed businesses, right? We got red for ed signs. I'm sure you guys have seen those red signs. They were everywhere. I mean, we literally painted the state red for ed. That's what we called it, paint the state red for ed. So that's kind of the whole thing. And by the time we called for a walkout, the whole state was with us. We, you, there was not a question about who we were, what we wanted, and what we were doing. There were cars running down the highway with funding graphs and statistics about how Arizona is the worst in the nation for per pupil funding. I mean, it, it just happened. And now it's the number one issue in Arizona. And into the election, it helped us win some stuff. And it's still the number one talked about thing here in Arizona. So this escalating, and it, it didn't matter if you were a union member, it didn't matter if you even knew anything about organizing, you were welcome and you could come in because it was rank and file, bottom up, we drove this campaign. So I hope that helps. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna ask two quick questions and then I'll turn it over for others uh, to ask questions as well. Um, so uh, the first question I have is, um, you know, so in 2014, Karen Lewis was the speaker um, at the Labor Notes Conference, and she said ground zero is everywhere for education. The privatizers are out. Um, you know, we've seen Republican takeovers in many states, but even if there are Democrats in charge, they're, they're gutting, um, you know, gutting for the teachers unions and for education. Um, you know, the funding is at an all-time low. So we know that these problems persist everywhere. Um, and I think the lesson that I see in West Virginia and Arizona and many other states is this recognition that the Calvary is not coming to save us. Like, if, if we're going to fix this problem, it has to be led by the rank and file themselves. It has to be members taking control um, and driving their agenda. Um, and that is met with mixed responses from the union leadership. Um, so I'm wondering if, Emily, if you could speak a little bit to, like, um, what the response was like from the union leaders in your state and how you, you know, how the, what, what the relationship's like with the rank and file and pushing from below. And then, Rebecca, if you could speak after that to kind of this parallel course, you know, and how you've worked uh, with the union as well. Um, so what the response is like from the union leadership as we were pushing? Yeah, 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 like as this whole thing is, is coming up, like, you know, uh, and, and how you've held them accountable. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, they, again, I think that they, our union leadership um, was very, I'll say, I think they were anxious about the idea of a strike. Um, they, you know, uh, a strike had not happened uh, in a very long time here. It was just not uh, like anybody's wheelhouse, you know? Um, so it's not, not that, you know, in West Virginia, um, people here, there was a time here where strikes were a common thing, right? But uh, that's, it's not really the case anymore. And so, um, when people started talking about striking and all of a sudden social media was sort of blowing up uh, and people were saying, Hey, when are we going to go on strike? I think we should go on strike. This isn't going to be fixed unless we go on strike. Uh, our union leadership sort of said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Like what? Wait a minute. You're like, and I think that a lot of uh, them reacted in a way um, and not just, I don't want to just say the union presidents, but um, a lot of people who were more act had been more active in the union, um, sort of asked questions that were like, we can't get people to show up to a union meeting. What do you mean we're going to go out, go out on strike? Um, and you know, people, I, I, I'll just to that, I'll say that I had not been active in AFT. You know, I was active, uh, an active organizer outside of my union. Um, but I think there was the, you know, as soon as we uh, started this escalated campaign to actually win something, and it felt like we were headed in a direction where we might be able to win something, or at least that was the goal, um, suddenly people really wanted to be involved in that. And then they were involved in their union, right? 
Um, but I think that uh, for a long time, I'm sort of not, I'm off track. I'm not really answering your question anymore, but um, for a long time, that's uh, just not what uh, has happened here in our unions. So yeah, it was just a different, it was very much a, a different uh, path. It, it, what was happening here and the kind of organizing that was happening looked different from what the union leadership had been doing. Um, it was unfamiliar to them and um, I think it made them uncomfortable. But I mean, now I'll say that this year um, they've been quicker to respond to it um, and they've not tried to tamp it down as quickly. I mean, they were quicker to call a strike vote this year. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you. And Rebecca? So ours, uh, you know, our situation is very unique. Uh, because of West Virginia, Oklahoma, Kentucky, you know, being our predecessors, we didn't, we didn't, we, <laughs> Because of how it went down there, we knew we had to work together, quite honestly. We saw it kind of sort of fail in Oklahoma, kind of sort of fail in Kentucky, West Virginia, you guys, I don't even know if your union was involved. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't see the union in any of the people who came before us. So I think our union was right away on board. I mean, Joe Thomas, our president, he, uh, you know, in a, I don't know what you guys know about the history of Red for Ed, but part of the way it started is between a conversation of one of our main leaders, Noah, and our union uh, president, Joe Thomas. And Joe, uh, Noah said, well, I see West Virginia going out and other people like, do you think Arizona should do something? And Joe Thomas was like, well, why don't you try a red shirt? See how many people you can get to do that. And so it opened the door with just a tiny little tweet. And I mean, we knew that the union was going to be on board. There was no reason not to. Arizona is literally last in the nation. For, I mean, it just can't get any worse. Um, and our legislature is uh, horrific. Um, so they were on board from day one. And what that looked like is in our third week is they invited us to come and we sat in, at the union hall and, and, you know, talked about things. And um, I think we all just knew that it didn't matter who was, driving the bus. We knew that the, we, the rank and file, needed to be the voice that was out in front because that's the only way this was going to happen. The union came alongside us and provided the resources and infrastructures that we didn't have. Yes, we ended up building our own union literally from the ground up, but they had Action Network already set up that we could just plug in right away and start using it. They had space they had organizers all ready to go that they could disperse throughout the state to do trainings, which we did trainings um, for our, our liaisons. They, they helped us train our people. They got the space, the materials, and they sent folks out. So we really became this one kind of family, if you will. Um, but it did kind of stay like this, but we worked together, right? They had, they had one thing. We had the voice of the teachers and the people power. They had the organizing structures and the funding ability and, and that sort of thing. And NEA came in at some point and helped us too. So it was really this beautiful relationship of understanding. And yeah, you know, it wasn't always, you know, shiny roses and, and glorious rainbows, but you know what? We were all in it together and we, it didn't matter who threw the touchdown. We just wanted to win, however that happened. And so I think ours is unique and, and we still work with them now. Like we're on weekly calls with them every Monday night. Um, so we still work together because we still all want to win. It's all about winning. And the only way you do that is if you join together and you have solidarity and you respect each other and you find a way to work together. And we have, you know, AEA here, Arizona Education Association. Um, but we only have one third of members out of our or teachers, sorry, out of all the teachers, only one third of them are actual union members. So if you think of how many people actually came to our march, which was about 75,000, we had everybody plus the community. So it didn't matter, this, this union versus non-union, that needs to go. It need, you got to get rid of that. This is rank and file from the bottom up. And if your union is not doing bottom up organizing, if it's top down in any way, it's not going to work. If it's member driven, rank and file driven, if the union does the work that the members want, then you're in a good spot. And that's what a union should be doing. 
And I only say that because I was part of Chicago Teachers Union for 11 years and I, I, I have learned the ways and it works. It works. And when people voice their concerns to their union and their union listens and responds adequately, that's how you win. You work together, you figure out a path and you continue to just navigate together. That's why we worked is, and with our liaison network, you know, when we went to do our strike authorization vote, it was the local presidents across the state that had the materials and dispersed them, but they dispersed them to our liaisons too. So we had not only union reps, we had liaisons and we filled every gap necessary. And that's why we were successful is because it didn't matter if you were a union member or not. If you were a rank and file member, which is everybody, you were in and your voice could be heard and you got to, to, to vote on um, everything. It was a democratic, you know, the way we should be doing organizing democratically and all of that. So that's how we were successful. All right. So one, one last question and I'll, and then I'll let uh, others let's ask questions as well. Um, so what do you say to folks who say, uh, we can't do this. It's illegal. They'll retaliate against us. We'll lose our certification. You know, what do you, what do you, how do you respond to that? Me? I'll go first. I, I'm just laughing here because that's ridiculous. Um, we had that same fear here and our leverage came from the fact that there's 2000 teacher vacancies. They are giving away emergency certificates faster than anything you've ever seen before. I mean, if you're a warm body, you can teach here, right? And so our leverage is there are a ton, you have nobody to fill these spots. It's not going to happen. And so that's one, you got leverage. Second is through all of this, as you escalate, and you build that public support and awareness, our districts just started signing, our governing board started signing resolutions in, in, in support, just like West Virginia and Oklahoma did the same thing. And they posted district by district who signed those resolutions. So once one district started doing it, then people were like, oh my gosh, I'm not afraid. My district's supporting me. My governing board's supporting me. Okay, well, maybe striking is illegal, but guess what? What are they going to do? They can't do anything if schools are closed down. We have all of the power. And so once district after district started, you know, signing these resolutions, people go, oh, I, I can't lose my certificate. I can't, none of this happens because school's closed. I'm not walking out of my job if school's closed, right? And that's the power of the sick out that just happened in Kentucky. If only 40% of their people called out sick and they had to shut down school. That's power. That's where your power come from. What are they going to, they tried to fine us $5,000 for wearing red shirts. There's 60,000 of us go for it. I'd love to see you try, you know, bring it on. I mean, seriously, this ridiculous, I'm sorry. I'm just so fired up about this because our legislators are trying to punish us again right now. It's hilarious. It's not going to happen. What are they going to do? The beauty of being a teacher is we just like nurses, cannot be outsourced. We cannot be computerized, even though they're trying to pull that. We can't. We are necessary. And just like West Virginia taught us, it's our labor. It's ours to give. And it's ours to take away. Right? Thanks to Nicole McCormick for that amazing quote. So it's not going to happen. They're not going to. What are they going to do? Yeah, I'm totally with Rebecca on this. And I think... I you know, I'm really surprised by how this really did not come up. Like when we, of course, when we were organizing to go out, people, I talked to lots of teachers who were scared. Um, but this did not seem to be the thing that they were scared about. And I think that it's because we have massive shortages in West Virginia. And really, you know, um, when the issue of striking being illegal came up, people said, you know, they're, what are they going to fire us? They can't fire us. We're, we know how hard it is to get a sub to show up. We don't have enough subs. Um, if, if, they can even, if, you, if you can't even get a sub to cover your class, um, how are they going to fire certified teachers? Um, it's just not possible. It was a, it was a joke. The, the, the idea of the strike being illegal was actually a joke to people. What did scare people, uh, was losing pay, the idea of losing pay, but we talked through that with people. I mean, we didn't, we so far have not had to lose pay because schools have been shut down. Um, 
however, and so it's been kind of in the back of my mind, you know, if we, uh, if our superintendent were to leave schools open, what would that look like? And we had that um, happen, we had that come up in Putnam County, um, our neighboring county to the one I'm in, um, the last strike, it, it was the only county uh, out of all 55 that the superintendent kept schools open. And they had not a single bus ran in Putnam County. All the bus, 100% of the bus drivers uh, stayed out on strike for, but we were only on strike two days. Um, and there was 80% participation from teachers and other school service personnel in the schools. So 20% uh, of workers crossed the picket line. But I think for being um, called, you know, the strike being called literally the night before um, and it being organized so quickly, I think that's pretty good participation, 80. <laughs> um, so there you go. Great. Um, so uh, I, what we'll do is we'll take uh, two or three questions um, at once, uh, and then we'll let um, Emily and Rebecca respond to that. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to see if we can do this in an orderly way. Um, so uh, who has a question? I have a question. Um, I joined the conversation late, so I'm not really sure if you talked about this or not. Um, but when you when you started talking about organizing, obviously there's reason to organize. That's not the issue. But did you have specific legislation in mind that you organized around, like to rally people? Um, does that make does that question make sense? Like, what, was that the impetus for you to? actually you know strike or sick out or walk out was it based on a pending piece of legislation okay that's a great question so we'll, we'll just take two more questions and then and then we'll, we'll let everybody answer who else has a question um hi my name is janae and i'm just curious uh for both west virginia uh, in Arizona, uh, you know, post striking, post walking out, six out, you know, can you uh, kind of elaborate on maybe um, how your union has been redefined or how it has changed or how it hasn't changed? Uh, I'd be curious to, to listen to that perspective. That's a great question, Janae. Um, okay, so does somebody else have another question? Um, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess I'm from Tennessee, and I want to know what is the first step? Great questions. Okay, so the questions are, what was the impetus of the specific legislation that you were responding to um, to, to lead with the walkout? <laughs> How has the union changed since then? And uh, what was the first step? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so there, when we started organizing, um, you know, the first time around in West Virginia, there was not already legislation on the table because we started organizing way before the legislative session, months and months before, but there was an issue that we were organizing around that everybody was, you know, upset about, and that was our health insurance. So uh, we found out that our healthcare costs, that our plan year, uh, you know, that our healthcare costs for plan year 2018 were going to uh, rise dramatically. Um, and those were changes that were instituted by the PEIA board. Um, and that uh, basically like the legislator, legislature had not allocated enough money to keep up with uh, rising healthcare costs the year before that. And uh, in order to fix that, basically, the next, the upcoming legislative session, we would have to get them to uh, uh, allocate more money. Um, and so we were successful in doing that, at least for, you know, we got a freeze for that plan year. But anyway, yeah, we had, we had that issue um, that we were, that we built our campaign around because that was the thing that just in every school, everyone was talking about. People were saying, how are we, how am I gonna pay my bills? You know, this is, uh, 
there, I think this goes to the other question of uh, where do we start? Because uh, if you have an issue um, that is on everyone's minds that people are already uh, upset about, that's a really good place to start. Because looking at where West Virginia, where we were in West Virginia last school year, um, it was so much easier to organize around uh, a thing that people were already furious about compared to this year. It set us up to be able to fight something like charter schools, where a year ago, nobody even knew what a charter school was. Um, and so we've got all this momentum. Uh, and then this now this year, being able to educate people around this is what a charter school is. This is why it's bad. Um, this is why we can't allow them to come into the state of West Virginia. Um, so I think trying to start off uh, with like a political strike on an issue that nobody knows anything about um, is probably not good for your first strike. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, what was the third question? Um, uh, how the union has changed since this. Oh, I, I think it's changed uh, dramatically. I think people are so much more active uh, than they were before. You're seeing people that um, uh, were never involved in the union who are showing up to general membership meetings who are, you know, who are not just that, but who are like reading the news and asking like, how does this uh, local news factor into uh, what goes on in my union? And uh, like my coworkers are constantly asking, um, you know, what's going on? And they're, you know, they're, they are participating in the union. I'm building up at my school. And um, it actually feels like a, it feels like we have a union in our school. Um, it's very, very different. It's a different culture now. That's excellent. Do you have anything to add to that, Rebecca? Um, First, ooh, first step, obviously, get everybody in one space. However, you can do that. Like Emily went out and canvassed people and, you know, signed people up at town halls. Get everybody in one space. That's the first step. Then you really got to have a team. I mean, just a really solid team that's committed and dedicated. And we set up roles from the very beginning. Like I was in charge of actions. We had someone on research, you know, research and education. We had someone making a website. We just divided up the roles and we just conquered and we stuck in those roles. That was really a critical step for us. Um, as far as legislation, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, our governor tried to only give us, he proposed a 1% raise and we are the last in the nation. And I think that was happening, I've, I don't even remember, like a couple weeks before we decided to really start organizing. And so people were like, are you kidding me? We are the last. So I think just that fired people up. And then we just came up with our demands based on uh, we're bottom in the nation for XYZ. So we're going to fight for XYZ. Um, so it wasn't one specific piece of legislation, but when your governor says that you can have a 1% raise, but gives his own staff, a, I think it was a 20% raise or something ridiculous, that really fired people up. Um, and then I'm just gonna say, I don't know what it's like in Tennessee, but here in Arizona, the word union is like taboo, right? Your right to work, there's no unions. What are you talking about? There's no unions. And now the word union is everywhere. I mean, it just, we just completely changed the whole mindset. Everybody is talking about bills, house committees, set it, education committees. We're talking about, you know, how do we organize? We need to build power. I mean, just these, these buzzwords of unionism are everywhere. And it's, it's beautiful. So I think it shifted a complete mindset to people saying, we don't have unions in Arizona. This is right to work to, well, wait a minute. We do? Great. What do I do? How do I get involved? Where do I go? And so it was just total shift. Just completely different. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, so I think we have two hands raised. Uh, so Susan, mm -hmm. uh, yours was raised first. Is Norwood? I think I already asked my question about how do we start. Oh, okay, great. So I'll, I'll lower your hand then. Sorry. Uh, Tequila, I see your hand is raised. Hey, um, Tequila from Tennessee. I just want to know what type of questions did you all ask when you were canvassing or asking, asking 
individuals to join your group? Uh, what type of uh, questions were you asking at the time? Okay, so what kind of questions you asked, like when you were canvassing people to try to get them to join and get excited about the campaign? All right, so that's one question. Uh, Lauren, I see you, you raised your hand. Lauren, are you there? Lauren, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, does anybody else have a question? I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I guess my question is, how do I get people to wear red at my school and then other schools? I know it's a simple thing, but I need some talking points. Okay, so I mean, my initial reaction was red ed wearing red, big deal. Who cares? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, so how to get people to see why wearing red matters and how 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 do they could feel like it's important? That's a good question. All right, so we'll take we'll take one more question. Does anybody else have one? I have one, Chris. Go ahead, Larry. Um. I spoke with someone about these strikes from these different uh, states, and one of them was not illegal. This might have been Oklahoma. The laws prohibited them from striking against their local unions, not against the legislature. And because the strike was against the legislature, every which state it was talking about, it was not illegal. And so I haven't looked at our law in Tennessee to see exactly what it is. But mm -hmm. when our union, uh, lobbyists is telling everybody that we're not even thinking about it. Uh, I'd like was posted in the Tennessee and I think last year, maybe um, it's hard to get on board with the union and with the grassroots. And I think you know that because you've been here in our state before. So um, is, was it illegal for Arizona, West Virginia, or was it just illegal to strike against your locals? and not when you struck against your legislature. Okay, um, well, I could just say that in Tennessee, it is illegal to strike. Um, and I think we've, we've talked a little bit about that, but I think there's also this other question there is like, well, the union's already come out in response to West Virginia and Arizona been like, this is not a priority, we're not gonna do this. So, you know, what do you do given that being the case, right? Um, so maybe, so that, what questions did you ask and how do you get people to wear red? So how do you get people to wear red? Um, that's an education piece. Um, and you use words like um, visual presence. We need, I mean, it's, let's think. So I wanna say solidarity, but if people really don't understand what solidarity is, you really just need them to understand that the more we can visually see each other, the more we understand that we are together. Our numbers. It's a visual representation. It's like being on a team, right? You all wear the same color. And when you see someone wearing the same color of you sitting in your staff meeting, and there's a whole bunch of you, you're, you're sitting up a little bit straighter, right? You're going, wow, there's a lot of me. I feel good right now. And so we use words like solidarity down the road that, well, we didn't come out like union speak right away. We said we need to show, you know, visual presence. How many people can you get? And uh, we did some challenges, right? Like this school can get 10 people who can get more, you know, that kind of thing and make it kind of a fun little competition. Uh, but just really helping people understand the idea of solidarity in whatever way you can is how you message it and say, do you want to know if you're, you know, if you're alone or not? And the way you do that is by putting on a red shirt and seeing who's with you. It's a simple thing. Okay, you don't have to get into labor history of you know wearing red bandanas or anything, but it's that that act of solidarity. It's that who's with me? I'm not alone, and that's what really takes away that fear is to see that you're not alone. And what questions did we ask people? I don't think we asked very many questions. We were just like people were fired up. They were like, "Where do we go? Okay, sign up. Here's a Google form. If you want to get involved, you want to you want to self organize at your site." Here's our form, sign up, we need you, right? It wasn't like, um, I mean, I, we probably did a little bit of agitation, like 
are you happy with the current check you get or you know is, has your pay declined over the years and you know are you happy about the governor's proposal and you just agitate a little bit around those questions and just see what people bite onto and and what they i mean that you got to gauge people somehow so you find a way to agitate with the right questions that fit your situation for us it was uh is a one percent raise good enough if not join our team here's the form wear a red shirt yeah i'll um i'll add just a little bit that um when we uh when i talked to coworkers in my school about uh a you know red t-shirt day um i talked to them about why it's so important to all to do an action where we're all doing the same thing and how uh just the act of wearing red shows that all of us wearing red shows that we can all take a coordinated action together and how much even though it seems just really simple like how much power that demonstrates and how if we can take up just a picture of ourselves all wearing the shirt um you know and make that you know post that make it public um that uh demonstrates out into the world you know it demonstrates to our legislature when they see that right because we're tagging our legislate legislators in it um that we are capable of organizing mm -hmm. ourselves and getting everybody in the whole building on the same page. Um, and it, it doesn't have to end there, right? We're, we, uh, we can also organize ourselves to all get on the same page to maybe shut the building down, right? Um, that's the message that it sends. Uh, great, and so um, there was one more question from Lauren. Uh, Thornton, if she's still on. You just gotta unmute yourself. Um, if Laura's not there, I have a quick question too. All right, let's just give her just a second. Uh, Lauren, are you there? I can't find her phone on here, so I don't know which one of these she is. Okay. All right, well, go ahead. I guess the last question of the night. Oh, uh, am I the last question of the night? Okay. I think so, Mary, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, Rebecca, I met you in Indianapolis, and it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, watching what you guys are doing in Arizona and West Virginia is really inspiring. Um, my question is this. Right now in Tennessee, we have pockets of activism. We have, you know, an ongoing effort in Nashville to wear red for ed on Tuesdays, because that's the day we have our board meetings. We have, you know, people working hard in Memphis, in Johnson City, in Knoxville. And my question is, at what point did this become a statewide effort? Um, and I, I, I apologize if you addressed that earlier. I'm dealing with the 10 year old in bedtime. But um, at what point did that become a statewide um, force to be reckoned with? Like how, what are the, how did it come together statewide, if that makes sense? All right, and then Lauren messaged me um, her question, which was how long um, uh, did you plan each, you know, how long was the timeline for the strike? How long should they think that their timeline would need to be? So the last two questions. Like how long would they actually have to be out on strike? No, how long were you organizing before you went on? Oh, okay, okay. You know. Go ahead, um, Emily, take it away. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, oh my gosh. I don't remember what, how I was going to respond to the question. It's okay, well, we can uh, let Rebecca go first. You can okay. go first. Thank you. Sure. Um, so to address the first question about statewide, I think from the very beginning, there was no question uh, that it wouldn't be statewide. It was already statewide. I mean, we watched other states do it. So why don't we do it? Right. And it wasn't it wasn't um, one district doing something. It wasn't a rural district versus an urban district. It was our legislators doing it. And how do you organize against your legislators? Well, the governor is the state, you know, it's the state. So let's do a state. I think that was our mentality is everyone else did state, we're doing state. The problems are with the legislators. So, you know, it, it, it would be different if it was, you know, back when I was in Chicago, that was a city thing, it wasn't a state thing. 
here, obviously, it comes against the governor, not like the mayor and the mayor's policies or however, you know, your city is set up. Um, so there was no question that it was statewide, is my point. Um, so we didn't really have to think about it. It was, we keep going until, and we set goals along the way. I can't tell you how, how important that is. And we said, you know, we did three weeks of walk-in. So when you're thinking of the timeline, we, we organized a blitz in eight weeks from beginning to end. It was eight weeks. And we escalated along the way. Um, and I have a timeline somewhere that our union put together. I'm looking for it. Um, and Labor Notes wrote an article about our escalating campaign, too, that I'm sure Chris could send you guys at some point. Um, so we had eight weeks. And, and as we built, we, we took data and metrics as we went. And so what we said is, we, we, like, how do, you, how do you know you're ready to pull? What's the tipping point? When do you know your state's ready to pull that trigger? That's why you need data. And so we put out a goal and we said, you know, our, if we can get a thousand schools walking in, we can get a thousand schools walking out. And so that was our goal. And week by week, we ended up with 800 one week, then more than a thousand. And by the third week, we had over 1,200. And we were like, oh, oh, I guess we go out now, don't we? Shoot, we got to stay true to our word. We told everybody if we're doing a thousand, oh, we met a thousand. Okay, let's do a strike vote, right? So it was this expectation. Everybody knew the expectation. So as you're organizing, setting those you know, real goals that are tangible and attainable, um, really un gets people fired up. And, oh, I better go. We, we got to get to this number, right? It motivates people into action. And so that really helped us in our timeline. Um, and again, for statewide, you need, a way, you need a way to to measure where you're at and fill in the gaps. You need a way to track your data. Um, so that's helpful. Um, yeah, I'll uh, add that I think I'm not like a policy wonk by any means, but I will say that I know that in West Virginia are like the funding mechanism for uh, teachers like the uh, I don't know how to word this, but basically like our uh, so much. It's not even funding. It's basically just like so much of education policy uh, and funding is controlled by our state legislature. Uh, whereas in a lot of other states, it's control. It's like controlled at the district level um or like the county level and i don't know why that is i think west virginia is actually maybe unique in that way and so if we were going to it, well and also at the beginning um we were going out on strike over health care uh and in the, this was a statewide you know uh health care system right that uh uh covers one in nine people in our state. Uh, but even aside from that, um, West Virginia education policy is set by our state legislature and not by uh, individual counties for the most part. Um, so if we are going to affect change um, and we have to do it through a strike, it really does need to be a statewide strike, like a countywide strike wouldn't do much. Um, whereas you know, if the city of Los Angeles uh, is going to affect change, they can do that. You know, they can uh, put pressure on the city. So I, I don't know how, uh, I don't know if that's the case in Arizona. Um, I'm not sure. So I think we we'll just set the precedent for a statewide strike because of, because that's, uh, that's, that's a fun here. Yeah. yeah. Same here. Um, yeah, e even in Los Angeles, you know, where they had um, a multi-billion dollar reserve at the city level, they had a $21 billion reserve at the state level. And so they still were dependent on the state funding. So state legislatures in every state, even in places with massive cities and strong unions, um, you know, that's a, that's a major source of revenue that's really important. Um, so we are out of time and now it goes really fast. Uh, I really appreciate Emily uh, and Rebecca for joining us tonight and for sharing all this great wisdom and information with everybody. Um, this video was recorded, so we'll make sure to share out the link um, to folks in Tennessee, and I would encourage you to share it out with others. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, stay tuned to Labor Notes for more opportunities to have calls like this. Um, and if anybody ever is interested in trying to organize another call 
or um, or to participate in something like this again, you can feel free to contact me at chris at labornotes.org. Um, so thanks everybody, and I hope you have a great night. And uh, you know, good luck. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Good night. Thank you.